right, segment three, Golden Black Live. Uh, we are in, in it, this could go on all day, but it's been fun for the first two segments and have enjoyed it very much. Todd Mitchell I had to say goodbye because he is traveling, if you couldn't tell during the first two segments, on uh, a family trip to Florida, but we appreciate Mitch's time uh, being on with us. Rob Blackman, we want to go back to kind of what we were talking about, the things that, you, that people know about Larry, or don't know about Larry Clisby, uh, or things that they should know. But I also wanted to ask you as a, as a follow-up before I even ask you the first question, that is just, you know, the challenges, you know, you, you, you in the last couple of years with his health waning, uh, you had to, you, you know, you turned from color analyst to play-by-play -play kind of at the same time with Larry. But Larry kept his sense of humor through all of that, at least uh, as I listened to him on the air. Talk about that, but also talk about that experience of that mystical. We kind of hit on the mystical Larry Clisby, which is the 11-11. There's been a lot of that going around over the years in my experience. Well, I, let me just say this. Uh, Clis certainly had lost a step or two those last yeah. couple of years, and understandable. I mean, the guy had stage four lung cancer and brain yeah. cancer. But when it was time for him to shine, when he needed to be at his best, he could still do it. And yeah. one specific instance was the Ryan Klein step back three against Tennessee yeah. uh, down in Louisville two years ago. If you listen to that call uh, of Cliz making the call of him hitting that shot, uh, you don't hear a Larry Clisby that has stage four lung cancer and brain cancer. You don't hear a Larry Clisby who had been struggling just to put sentences together over the past three or four months. You hear the Cliz at his finest, right? he had that ability as a professional broadcaster to rise to the occasion when he absolutely had to have it. So did he struggle those la that last, last year or two? Yes, he did. Uh, obviously, who would not? But when he had to be at his best, and again, I go back to that, just that one specific call right there, uh, he was at his best. And that's, that's, I think that's what made him such a, such a joy to listen to as a Purdue fan, but more importantly, just kind of echoes again what a real professional he was. Yeah, no question. And that part of it, him was, uh, was very evident. I, I thought even in the year when he first came back, he, he worked hard to get to, yeah. you know, it took a lot for him to be able to, and he yes. got better throughout the course of the year. Uh, that really impressed me from that standpoint a, a great deal. Lanny Sego, there were some high moments on the court. Obviously, the 84 championship, 87 uh, uh, Big Ten Tri championship, 88 uh, as well. Troy Todd and Everett were like, as, as Larry would tell me, his favorites in a lot of ways uh, in terms of that. Just the highs of winning and, and, and being a part of that. Uh, uh, Gene Cady's rise, certainly, uh, and Larry Clisby and Lanny Sego's rise and being a part of that uh, journey had to be something very, very special. Larry always kidded me after we won the Big Ten Championship in 84. He said, you realize you're in your first year. <laughs> Some guys labor at this for years and never win a championship and you win a conference championship with Purdue in your first year and then of course uh 88 you know we lived and died with them uh I think you'll all agree losses in the NCAA tournament to end the season is like a train wreck yeah it's painful and 88 losing yeah. at the Silver Dome that was very painful, and we walk outside, and it's just pouring down rain. Um, but Larry and I had been criticized at times because we got on the referees too much. Yeah. And uh, at this particular time, Will Teeman was involved with yeah. Rasmussen Communications, RCM. And he'd have a sit-down with us and he'd say now you guys are just too critical on the referees and so we we listened to jim turpin doing the illinois games and lauren tate based right there in champaign where rcm is at and they were just as hard on the referees as we ever were and we had a hard time understanding that but we were at a tournament purdue was at arizona uh at tucson and we're sitting right courtside. And this referee blows his whistle and calls something that Larry thinks was very questionable and started scrutinizing him. And apparently the referee had heard what he had said. And so a little bit later, this referee is near us. And whether or not there was a justifiable foul called or not against Purdue, 
he called one against Purdue. And he walks up to Larry, or uh, both of us, and he takes his hand and he slaps it on the store book and he says, put that in your damn book. <laughs> and Larry looks at me like he's innocent and says, what, what, is he talking to me? I said, yeah, Larry, he's talking to you. He heard what you said. I always thought that was classic. Put that in your damn book. <laughs> hey, back. Mike, why, yeah, Mike, you had the chance or the challenge at times uh, to deal with him in football when things were tough. I mean, geez, you know, Fred Akers, is, as we try to refer to it, as the scorched earth of Purdue football. Uh, and I can remember some football games. And, Larry, you could, at least from my perspective, and you could tell where how the game was going in 30 seconds because if Purdue was getting a rear end kick, to, uh, that was that was the case. Basketball, obviously, a lot more success over the years. But talk about that and being able to tell Larry from that thing. And also, you know all the broadcasters, and he was a broadcaster's broadcaster. I was always amazed at how many – the Don Fishers of the world – uh, who's an excellent broadcaster in his own right, but th there was a great uh, affinity for his fellow broadcasters around the Big Ten. Yeah, definitely. And Fish is a, a quality broadcaster. And, no, no, and, no. And, uh, and I remember as a kid growing up in Logansport, Indiana, working for Vic Tangy that Lanny mentioned a little bit ago. I kind of tried to emulate myself after, after Fisher, my own play-by-play -play style. And then I heard Cliz, and I'm thinking, wow, oh, you know, this guy is Larry Clisby, Lanny Siegel. Wow, these guys are cool. And then uh, you know you get to do games with them, so but you you, you end up uh, you know getting to know them and 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 you start realizing what's making them tick. And in and, and Larry's place case, it was just all passion. Uh, and you know, Al, you you would ask, um, is he a professional or is he more of a fan? And the answer is both. So so he's, yeah. he's absolutely a pro, right? But um, but Larry is absolutely a fan. And you absolutely could tell in football. And so he lost, he lost a job in football, and it was really tough. And I was producing the network and running the network at the time. Everybody thought, well, geez, did you have something to do with that? And I absolutely did not. But, um, and, uh, but, but Morgan Burke did not like – he did, and he wanted to take Larry out of football and basketball both, and Gene saved his job on the basketball side. Um, and uh, – uh, but you absolutely could tell. But the thing of it is, in football, you know, we're going through one and ten, two and two and nine, three and eight seasons, and in basketball, we're winning conference titles. And everybody thinks he's more negative in football. Well, cause and effect, here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, but I will tell you, it's there's a correlation, a of, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so, but in, even in basketball, I mean, you you could really tell. Uh, I'll I'll give you a couple examples. Um, you know what, Lanny, I'm going to bring up one thing. Lanny, do you remember you brought up Will Teeman? And <laughs> um, back in, um, geez, I forget I forget when this would have been, but it's a kind of behind-the-scenes story. But they were our, our uh, network syndicator at the time, and Will was running it. And uh, um, this is when Cliz had been taken off the football broadcast. And, and uh, so in basketball, I think it's the 88-89 season, we finished yeah. up team 16. And, and – uh, Will gave us a really rough critique. Do you remember that, Lanny? Uh, yeah. He, a cr cr he never critiqued himself, though, it seemed like, in, in my list. <laughs> I think that's still going on with Will, but go ahead. That was trouble. And, and, and so, so he gives us this really rough critique, and all, all three of us, because we were all three doing the, the games together at, the, at that time, and it was crystal clear that his expectations were we're supposed to be a lot more positive. And we were on the referees, but we were negative about the team and that kind of thing, and Larry in particular. And he took uh, the brunt of it. We needed to be a lot more positive. So we got that in the critique in writing, spelled out pretty bluntly. And so – that was the day before we went to Michigan. So we go up there on the day before the game, and I think we got beat 14, 15 points or something, and, and, and honestly, it could have been 22 really easily. We just played awful. Um, but because we're under this directive from Will to be more positive, than Larry in particular, it was painful for him to do it, but he was trying to find the silver lining in everything all game long. And so we lost big. It was bad. Uh, and as we did back then, coach would come up to our broadcast position for uh, the post game. And uh, so Gene puts on the headsets. Larry's first words out of his mouth are something like, well, Gene, you know, it was a tough loss. Uh, but there were a lot of positives and we did some things really well tonight. And Gene kind of turned sideways at him and, and just stared at Cliz for what seemed like an hour of silence. 
And uh, he just looked totally stunned. And he finally said, what in the hell game were you watching? <laughs> and, uh, and, and that just blew all of our credibility out of the water. And it lasted for one game. And Close went back to being his normal self and just to tell things like they were. Uh, you know, and there just wasn't much involved. It blew anyway. credibility out the window, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't yeah. always the hardest thing to do in those days. You know, so that, I, that's true. Hey, that I always felt badly for, for Larry losing the football job stemming from something like that because, Alan, you're exactly right. If you're in the middle of a 1-10 in 10 season and it's halftime and you're having your lunch handed to you, there's not too many positive things to be describing. Yeah. And it's difficult for any play-by-play -play announcer, that's for sure. Steve Reed, uh, you know, you're one of the more competitive people I know just by the way you played the game and and, uh, and what I know of how you've lived your life. Larry's that way as well. Uh, you know, and talk about, we've talked a little bit about his competitiveness and kind of wanting to win, but uh, that, that part of Larry that was that way and then maybe also as a dovetail to that, that favorite call. I mean, you had you were there during some some good times and some really tough times at the end in terms of wins and losses uh, in Gene's later years. But uh, talk about that and 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 how that uh, made it fun, but sometimes challenging as a broadcaster. Well, Larry, you know, you guys mentioned the referees. I always got a kick out of Larry. Uh, he would name the referees on the game. You know, he would say, you know whoever's refing, he would, Teddy Valentine, right? He, he would name the refs and you could tell by the inflection of his voice who he liked and who he didn't. So he already went into a game with the attitude, I don't like this guy. And if you were a fan and you listened to him enough, you knew, uh oh, we're in, we're in trouble. So yeah, there's not many refs that, that, that uh, Larry really had an affinity for. And, um, you know, I always told people, have you ever listened to any of the broadcasts and within the first 30 seconds, you couldn't tell we were part of the Purdue radio broadcast network <laughs> and we weren't doing, we weren't doing our jobs, you know, cause yeah. that, that's just plain and simple. We were Purdue fans, Larry, you know, I, I wore the uniform. I had the opportunity to play. Um, Larry took defeats a whole lot worse than I ever thought about it. Now as a player, I took it pretty bad. You know, I, I didn't like him, but once I was not playing and then really wasn't invested in the blood, sweat and tears of being part, you know, on that team, boy, he was miserable. I mean, he, it would take him days to get over a, a loss and, uh, you know, in particular losses that, you know, against teams, maybe he didn't quite respect their, their program or what they stood for. Yeah. Um, he, he was just miserable uh, and, and would wear it for a long time. Um, probably my favorite, you know, the call, one of the calls, and unfortunately I stepped on him in this one, when Chad Austin hit the game winner down at Indiana, in my excitement, I created a new player. It was Chad Miller hitting the <laughs> end because Brad Miller was playing and Chad and I got the two conflated. But uh, And Larry didn't give me a hard time about that either. But, yeah, he, he wore the black and gold. And you guys mentioned the football. You know, I, I was there from 95 to 04, and he still talked about, you know, from time to time about not being able to do the football. He really – enjoyed and, and I will give credit to a lot I don't remember all the football coaches around that time they continued to keep Cliz included in that little network of people you know so they kept him involved in that which which I thought was really classy um, but yeah Larry Larry was a Purdue guy and I always used to you know, I said do you like Purdue football more than basketball and he would never answer the question he just liked Purdue at the end of the day but uh, you know you mentioned coach Katie uh, stepping up to kind of save his job I think that probably happened more than once throughout Larry's career and Larry was loyal to you couldn't say a bad word about coach I mean if you try if anybody tried to um, Larry was going to jump up immediately and, and come to his defense had a tremendous loyalty not only to coach Katie but all those that you know contributed to to his career really loyal guy yeah, Did I say no that? yeah go ahead Lanny Steve I have great memory of you and uh, your your time with Purdue you know coach Katie he ran that solid gold offense, yeah. and a lot of times that ball <laughs> at your hands down the stretch from about 15 to 18 feet, and you buried a lot of shots, and you buried a lot of teams with them. And I'll so, Lanny, were you, Lanny, you were there then. Um, again, this is not a clip, but Cliff was involved in it. The, the trip we brought, we, we played Illinois and got beat 86 to 43. You're right. Yeah, got killed. 1985. And we always we always stopped at the beef house on the way home. Well, one o'clock in the morning, we stopped at the beef house. Troy Lewis and Everett uh, Stevens and Todd Mitchell were all freshmen. 
the guys have been around know just kind of shut up, right? Well, the managers get off the coach cases, sit down. You know, we, we're not going in. The managers come bring, bring cold cheeseburgers and fries or whatever and give us – and it was either Troy Everett or Todd, I don't remember which, but one of the three freshmen asked for ketchup. <laughs> and Coach Katie absolutely blew, blew a gasket. And that was one of those things, Clisby, we got back off the bus. He pulled whoever it was across and said, boys, you don't ask for ketchup when you just got beat by 43 points. <laughs> so uh, yeah, was, the, the, the last part of that story, we get back to Mackey at 3 o'clock in the morning. We're on the, we're on the floor at 4 o'clock, full tape job. We go till 6 o'clock in the, in the morning, full practice. Um, yeah. So now I think Larry story, might stuck around. That story has gotten a shelf life. But that's another iteration of it because I hadn't heard the hadn't heard the ketchup story recently. Uh, that story has made that made the wire, so to speak, uh, in Larry's Larry and the Gene Cady lore certainly. Elliot Bloom, you know, you had that chance to you know that relationship with Matt Painter. Matt Painter's obviously a different guy than Gene Cady, but there's a very special relationship there. Respect. Uh, did Larry ever? I mean, when, when talking to Matt, or I know you guys had philosophical competi- uh, conversation, but that that relationship, what was that like for Larry and for Matt? I mean, in terms of how did how did Larry and Matt uh, talk to one another in those days? Uh, I mean, it was as tight as you can get. I think um, this will give you an idea. When we went to Italy, uh, boy, it's probably been uh, ten years ago now, uh, nine years ago. Uh, Cliz and uh, Coach Painter room together. Yeah. They're roommates on that trip. <laughs> and so that I think, you know, you're on a 13, 14 day, you know, European trip. That that probably tells you all you need to know. Those guys room together. And that was Coach's, you know, choice. Um, that's the relationship they had. I mean, they were as, as tight as, as anybody. And, I, and I, can, I can remember over the years, different announcers in the league talking to Galeri and saying, do you, do you know how good you have it? Yeah. And, and Clay's going, yes, yes, I do. Like he knew, and he knew, and like he, he, he loved being part of it. We loved having a part of it. But I think a lot of the announcers around the league looked at him with a little bit of envy that they, he got to do the stuff he did with the staff and he was as tight as he was with the players, the coaches, the support staff, because a lot of guys around the league, you know, everybody runs it different. And we've been really spoiled here to have two coaches over the last 40 plus years, but also have two guys that are about as humble as you can get, you know, coach Katie and coach painter, both, although different in a lot of ways are also very similar in the fact that they never take themselves too serious they always appreciate the little guys around the program. They treat people with respect, with class. And uh, so he was very much appreciative of that. I remember him telling tell me a story about Coach Katie and him got into it one time on the coaches show set. And they had a little bit of a crossword. And he said, and the next day I got a phone call from Coach. And he said, Coach Katie was like, well, I have, uh, I have something for you. And he goes, what's that? He goes, well, I ordered some new Nike golf shoes and I ordered an extra pair for you. So if you want to come by and get them. And he said, that was coach's way of saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about yesterday and the fact that we got into it. And uh, that's just the relationship you have with those two guys. And he was the guy that bridged the gap. You know, if you were a player and you played for coach Katie or for coach painter, you know, the one guy that was the constant was Cliz. And so those guys, when we have our reunions every couple of years um, that come back, you know, everybody, everybody gravitated to Cliz. You know, I mean, the guys that played for Coach Katie, I mean, everybody gets along with everybody anyway uh, because it is a true basketball family. But no matter who it was, um, everybody was lining up to, to at least say hi and catch up with, with Cliz every year. Yeah, and that's a true thing. Ralph Taylor, you know, you look at, the, look at his, um, his, Larry's, everything he's done in the, in the Purdue basketball family, which everybody really on this – on this call is part of and that's a very unique thing and Elliot's had a lot to do with keeping that uh, keeping that going uh you know you talk about that you know you've obviously played for George King and played in the final four but uh, and then came into this relationship but obviously you were around Purdue basketball all those years but talk about Larry you know to me it it surprised me a little bit the, the depth of people's caring at the, at, 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 not only after he passed, but when he, you know, the, the, the this experience of, of, of the, the benefit game during the summer and all the outpouring for him, did it surprise you at all in terms of uh, what, uh, what, what transpired from a fan perspective and the love for Larry Clisby? 
really was surprised by the uh, support from the players and fans because players were one of those figures where people would just gravitate to just because of his outgoing personality and I think the true love he had for Purdue sports and the way he treated people, I think it was just a natural love affair. And uh, and I think when I think back at the end, the thing I remember most about Cliz was he was an inspiring person, maybe without his knowing it, because when I went to his uh, wedding in uh, Florida and by the way, Ellie did a great job officiating the service. I didn't know Ellie had that in him. And, uh, <laughs> but I think the thing that inspired me about that was the fact that here a guy was dealing with, you know, stage four cancer. He's getting married. And at the wedding rehearsal, he's sitting the whole time. He can barely move. Yeah. The next day at the wedding, you know, the somebody, the music is being played. It's Saturday Night Fever or something like that. Here comes this guy that cannot move on Friday, and he comes dancing to the altar. And I mean, I was just inspired. I thought, how, how could he have just been so lethargic and out of energy one day, the next day, full of life, dancing down the aisle? And that's something I'll always remember about the plays at the end. Just yeah. really an inspiring figure. I don't even think he knew how inspiring. I mean, it really touched me. I mean, that, that was just to show the type of character he had and just the grit and courage that, that he really had. Yeah, that's a it's a great story, and and uh, uh, you know I think about the depth of his his desire. I remember the '88 game, and Lanny, I think Lanny would have been doing the game, and Mike might have been on the broadcast as well. '88 game at Michigan, and Purdue had been as you may remember the year before had been embarrassed and 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 by Michigan and Antoine Jobert and got beat by 30 some points there. Purdue wins that game in '88 against Gary Grant and uh, Ramil Robinson and company. And Larry walking back from uh, the broadcast position to, uh, to interview Gene Katie in tears. I mean, absolutely, just because the emotion of winning and what he had been through throughout that course of uh, on a personal level uh, in terms of that. And Rob, I guess it is a tough question to answer, but that emotional side of Larry Clisby, uh, you again experienced that as many others did on this call, but uh, uh, down the stretch, but also through your time, watching that uh, percolate uh, uh, at a very deep level that something that fans didn't always see from him uh, being the, the more jovial uh, devil may, may care guy on the air. Well, uh, you, you phrased it well there, Alan, when you said maybe what the fans didn't see. Yeah. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to bring up a very specific uh, instance of that. The, you had, when you emailed all of us earlier, you'd ask that at least we need to have maybe in the back of our minds a, a favorite game or a favorite call from Cliz. Actually, for me, it's an all-time favorite post game. Uh, it was the, the very first uh, real game, not an exhibition game, but a real game back uh, for Purdue, Mackey Arena, after Cliz had been diagnosed with the cancer there a couple of summers ago. And I'm assuming Elliot and Coach Painter were a part of this, but uh, they had the team, after the game was finished, they had the team come back out of the locker room. I remember Ryan Klein was kind of leading the group, uh, presented Cliz a game ball uh, after that win, that, that first win of the season, uh, again, in a regular season game. And I just remember how overcome with joy Cliz was and how much that meant to him on an emotional, from an emotional level, right? I think he always understood that, you know, he was kind of a big deal because he was, um, especially amongst the fans, but to have the team do what they did and deliver that game ball. And again, Mackey Arena was basically empty at this point. Everyone had gone home. Uh, there was no one really left other than the broadcast crews and, and the team coming back out of the locker room. But uh, that will, for, for me personally, Alan, that will always be my all-time favorite memory of the Cliz is seeing the look on his face when Ryan Klein handed him that basketball. And there was the team, you know, all with, with Ryan. And I remember Ryan, I specifically remember him saying, we love you, Cliz. And Cliz was just overcome with emotion, right? Game ball, he's, the tears are flowing. It was just such a great moment and just kind of encapsulates what Cliz meant to Purdue basketball, at least from my, from my vantage point anyway. That would always, always be my favorite memory. All right, well said. We're going to do a little lightning round as we bring this to a close. And I'm grateful for all your time today. We went through a little extra time, but uh, uh, again, we could go on for hours on this topic. So I'm going to start, Lanny, you g give you 30 seconds to a minute uh, and t encapsulate uh, anything else you want to say about the Cliz, and we'll go on down the line uh, in, in, in order, so to speak, of, uh, of time of the, that you were broadcast. Real quickly, when I graduated from high school, my senior high school newspaper. I laid out my goals. 
One of them was to do Purdue basketball on radio. I certainly might not have never realized a lifelong goal had it not been for the recommendation of Larry Clisby. Well said. Mike Wild, you've uh, had a career, a great career in, in, in radio and in broadcasting uh, and grew up uh, wanting to do this as well. Give me your, your insight. Well, um, you guys were talking about uh, what really uh, makes Cliz Cliz. And um, I, I do have one final story. With, yeah. and, and this goes back uh, 30 years or so, uh, but it just kind of uh, illustrates where his heart and his mind and his competitiveness uh, and his love for Purdue was. Um, but back when Breslin Center was fairly new, and so this would have been uh, 90, 91, something like that, mm -hmm. a broadcast right. position was courtside, as it usually is. And um, uh, in this case, it happened to be, though, <laughs> somebody's infinite wisdom, right in front of the Michigan State student section. And uh, so there was nothing but an aisle separating us. There's no railing, there's no nothing else. And right there on the front row, there's a whole bunch of shirtless MSU guys with big M's painted on their chests. Uh, and, they're, and, and we're getting beat. I think we got beat maybe 15 points that year up there or something like that. So it's just another story about you know, how bad he takes losses. And, um, and these guys are trash talking and trying to trash talk into our microphones and everything because they're right behind us. And I mean, they were, they were, they were F-bombs dropped and everything else. Uh, and uh, so Cliz and I turned around, looked at him a couple times, and I think that just incited the riot even more. But anyway, Cliz <laughs> got to a breaking point. We're going to a commercial break. Um, and I think he had the headsets off before he even threw the, the system cue. And he slams the headsets down and he turns around and he's going to take them all out. And, and, and seriously, he got up in their faces and there is pushing and shoving both ways. And I, before I even really knew what was going on. And so finally I get up and I'm trying to wrap my arms around his shoulders, trying to hold him back and keep both of us from getting our ass kicked from you know, about 700 you know, Michigan State students. And uh, the police had to come over and separate everybody. And, uh, and, and literally, I don't know what would have happened if that would have happened today, but uh, but but literally, they kind of separated everybody. Larry turns back around, puts his heads ba headsets back on. He's pissed. The commercial break ends, and he finishes the game just like normal. Um, and uh, but, but he he was so passionate that that is his passion and his love for Purdue. And by the way, a sidebar to that story is the next year we get there, our engineer Gary Klein's looking all over for our courtside spots, and there's nothing labeled Purdue Radio. And finally, somebody comes up and and points way up here under the rafters um and so they've got a card table set up right on the other side of the aisle from the concession stand at the top level of breslin and that's where visiting radio was for several years at michigan state and around the big 10 everybody knew it and referred to it as the clisby rule um <laughs> so but, but that was just larry he was feisty he was competitive and he would defend purdue to the end of time and uh, so I, I think that just kind of embodies his whole mindset about uh, uh, his love of, of uh, boiler basketball and, and, and Purdue in general. And uh, uh, he, he just uh, had uh, that, that was that just embodied his life, I think. Well said. Steve Reed, you're up, so to speak. Yeah, the two, just a quick follow up to that one. Uh, so every the first five years we went to Brunson Center, he would have to tell me that exact same story that Mike <laughs> just went through. There you go. And he, he he referred to it as the Larry Clisby Suite. You know, that was what he referred to that area. I kind of liked it because nobody was around you. But uh, yeah. you know, the one thing I think about Larry and 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 we all be blessed to do things we love, right? We we always hear, you know, if you could spend your life doing something that you love, uh, how how fortunate you are that. And Larry did, you know, he got a chance to spend his time doing what he loved to do. And he took a lot of pride in being the quiz. He really did like that monitor of being the quiz. He liked it out in the public. He liked it, you know, to talk about it. He just, he liked that part. He loved Purdue and he just had a, a great blessing. But uh, one of my favorite things with Clue, and we probably did, I was within 10 years and we probably did it eight out of 10 years. We get to the Minnesota game early, you know, we get with the teams. So we always got to the games early 
And he would want to go around and try to pick out the worst seat in the stadium because of Minnesota. You know, they've got TVs up in the in the uh, seating area because there's actually beams and you have a season ticket that you can only see half the floor. And he just got the biggest kick out of that to be able to go and, and try to find the worst seat and see if we could figure out next year if we could find a worse seat than that. Uh, the last story, and then I'll be done, uh, and I've got I've got to run, but – so we're in, we're in Alaska, and everybody that, that did Purdue basketball knows Jeff Washburn, right, uh, yeah. with the Journal Courier, the, the beat writer. So we're in Alaska over Thanksgiving, and there's no place to eat. Well, Washburn finds a place for us to eat Thanksgiving meal in Alaska. And it was a really good meal, full course, lots of food. We're all kind of stuffed to the gill, and the waitress comes up like they always do and says, well, do you guys want dessert? And Larry says, well, what do you have? And she starts to mention something. And the last thing was chocolate pie. And you go around the table, ask you one thing, no, no, no. And it comes to wash, and he says, no, no pie. And Larry looks at him with just the most curious look, says, no pie wash? And I, I, I for the life of me, <laughs> from that time on, Jeff Washburn was pie wash or just pie. That was all we called him was pie. So uh, that was Larry. He had a way to uh, to just put a kind of a statement on a moment and uh, make you remember that for quite some time. Yeah, well said. And that's uh, that is Larry uh, Elliot Bloom. You're up, my friend. I've heard the pie wash story many, many times too, Steve. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could tell stories all day. I think the big thing for me is, uh, and Alan, you might be able to relate, just being kind of a, a storyteller yourself. Um, I'm just thankful all these stories have lived on, and yeah. uh, and as long as um, you know, as long as Rob and I are still around, the team and Coach Painter, uh, we're still going to tell those stories, and we're just going to try to you know keep the those things going, and um, all those different memories, whether it was. Uh, moments that happened on the mic or, or off the mic um, in his personal life. Um, he always talked very fondly of his time at the radio stations and also at TV 18. And, and the way he talked about TV 18, it, it makes me think of, a, he would always say, you know, a small market introductory news station um, in an affectionate way, but yeah. it, made you think, it made you think of like a Parks and Rec or office type, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, situation where there's a lot of the, uh, the small time humor, so to speak, and the, the stuff that goes wrong at places like that. And I've got so many of those stories that I've heard over the years that I felt like I, you know, I lived them. And uh, a number of years ago, I had some some friends um, over to the house and, and I asked Larry to stop by too and have dinner with us. And we ended up spending several hours and I think Larry held court for a majority of that time. And uh, to this day, it's, it's when we bring some of those things up, um, they comment on the fact that what an enjoyable evening that was. And that's the thing I think at least I'll miss is, you know, the relationship with him, but also just all those laughs and funny stories that we told. We had a night like that in Spain a few years ago, my wife and coach Painter and his wife, Sherry and Cliz, the five of us went to a restaurant. It was very late in the evening, got the restaurant about 11. I think we walked out at two in the morning and we laughed the entire three hours that we were together. And it was all those stories. And that's what, that's what I miss the most. I miss laughing with the dude the most. And, and uh, to hear some of these stories and get some laughs is, uh, is always a great thing. Yeah, no question. Uh, uh, there, there were a lot of those from that standpoint. Ralph Taylor, uh, you've told some stories already, but uh, uh, you get the second to last word. And then Rob Blackman, you're, you're, the, you're going to get the last word here. Uh, but uh, Ralph, uh, what else do you have to say about the Cliz? Well, Clay is definitely was one of a kind when I was president of the downtown Rotary Club. I invited him to come and uh, introduce Coach Painter. And Coach Painter was our featured speaker. And I said, Clay, uh, you have two minutes to introduce Coach Painter. He said, not a problem. So they arrive and Clay goes up to the podium. And after about 10 minutes, I'm pointing to him that his time was up. And he went beyond, you know, introducing. He didn't introduce Coach Painter until about the 12 minute mark because he spent the first 11 minutes talking about himself. Because it's close, yeah. Left, yeah. <laughs> then the other thing I think I'll always remember when he was diagnosed with stage four cancer in 2000, summer 2018, I would call on him, just check, see how he was doing. He said, you know, I have one one thing I really want to do, and this kind of epitomized his love for new basketball and new family. He said, I just want to be able to be back at Mackey, all the 
to call the first game of the season. That's that's what I'm living for, call the first game of the season. And, of course, you know, he, he made it to the first game of the season, and he made it through that entire season. That's one of those things I'll always remember about him, again, with his courage and grit to overcome a lot of uh, hardship that he never really complained about, at least to me, he never really complained. Yeah, well said. Rob? Oh, well, actually, I, I wasn't thinking of this story till Mike Wilde started talking about the feistiness and competitiveness <laughs> of the Cliz. And then we got to talking about how he can be, be a little ornery on the road. So I will, I'll, uh, I guess, uh, wrap this thing up with this story. And Elliot was a big part of this story. Uh, a number of years ago, we're playing at Ohio State. And uh, <laughs> I can already see that Elliot is laughing. <laughs> and the game is over. We have just lost again at Ohio State. This was part of that run where we just could not win at the Value City Arena. You remember when they opened that new building, yeah. but we could not win there for whatever reason. Just had terrible luck. Uh, so the game is over. Everyone, you know, the broadcast teams are wrapping up their equipment, getting ready to head out. And as usual, uh, as what happens normally in the broadcast business, if one of the radio guys sees the other team's radio guy on the way out the door, you know, they say, hey, good game. We'll see you down the road or whatever. Just a, you know, quick little kind complimentary word. So the longtime play-by-play -play voice of Ohio State is Paul Keels, who is a friend, by the way, of Cliz's and had been for a number of years. As Paul is walking past our broadcast area as we're wrapping up, uh, Paul says, hey, a good game, Cliz. We'll see you at your place in a couple of weeks. And Cliz looks at Paul and he says, you know what, Paul? F you. <laughs> he goes i'm so i'm so tired of losing to your asses this is a bunch of bleep 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 bleep, bleep. And he said he says when you come to our place in two weeks i'll guarantee you this we're going to kick your ass we're kicking your ass in two weeks i'm sick of this and poor you know paul's looking at me and i'm looking at paul and we're just like i think we should just be quiet you know we'll just you know he's in a mood let's just let it be so Paul does the professional thing, just walks away, you know, okay, Cliz, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And so anyway, to finish, to bring the story full circle, I let Cliz simmer in this for a couple of days. And I eventually see him a couple of days later at practice, basketball practice. And I say, Cliz, I just want to let you know, just trying to be your friend here. You're probably a little, little hard on Paul Keels, probably a little inappropriate, quite frankly, the way you handled that the other night. And Cliz is like, I know, man, you're right. You're right. I, I should probably apologize to Paul next time I see him and say, yeah, it probably wouldn't be you know, that bad just to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry about that, Paul. And so when you know it, not only did he apologize to Paul when they came to Mackey Arena about two weeks later, he continued to apologize to Paul every single time we played Ohio State for the next few years. Uh, I mean, we're talking 10 years later. He'd be like, hey, Paul, look, I just want to – I know, I know. You've, you've apologized 100 times over. So, yes, uh, Mike got me thinking about that story, the competitiveness, the fire that Cliz had, the love for his Boilermakers. Yep, he was all of those things, absolutely. Yeah, well said. Redemption and reconciliation are two key words in Larry's life, I think, uh, that might encapsulate a lot, of, a lot of his life and his living years. Gentlemen, thanks so much. I've been privileged, I'll say myself, uh, uh, to, to be in your presence and enjoy this time. And uh, I, I'm guessing that, uh, that Elliot on his uh, podcast will do a little bit more of this as well. There's a lot to be done here because I think as Elliot, I would agree so much with Elliot, what Elliot says. The importance of this is, is history and letting this live on. And every one of you, each of you, have had an important role in that. Uh, and I, I know I can speak for uh, Purdue sports fans and Purdue basketball fans. That is important. And, and Purdue football fans as well. So thanks again so much for your time. Thanks also to WLFI, uh, which was Larry Clisby's employer. And that's a whole other story. Uh, but want to thank them as well. And, of course, Hilton Garden Inn, Triple X, and of course, State Farm agent Trent, jo Trent Johnson. Gordon Jackson, Scott Center, appreciate your help. Guys, again, thanks again. Uh, we'll look forward to, who knows, we might make this an annual event. You never know. So just, just what you guys all need. Uh, thanks again so much for your time and uh, uh, be well and have a great rest of the weekend. We'll be back next week, our last show of the year uh, with Golden Black Live. Tom Deanhart and Brian Newbert got the week off. Uh, uh, they're probably happy about that. And we'll look forward to doing that as we put uh, an end of our 12th season at Golden Black Live. Again, have a great week, everybody. Thanks again.